Hey everyone, we're the Violet Reality. My name is Casey Rain. I'm here with Kim Camellia. We are sitting in the basement of the Herrick Gallery in London, where for the next few days, we have an amazing event, prints a London private view photography exhibition by the one and only Afshin Jahidi. So you know that we had to get Afshin here for an episode of your favorite show, Uncovering Prince. Let's take it all the way back to the very beginning first. When did you first meet Prince? Um. Great question. I met Prince uh, before he met me. I met him when I was in junior high and, and I discovered uh, uh, 1999, the album. So not in person, but I heard his music and I think that to me was a huge introduction and it, and it made me just stop and try to figure out who this person was and go back. And that's before I even realized he's from Minneapolis. And then I realized he's from Minneapolis. I'm like, oh my God, there's this dynamo that lives here. Uh, so then I discovered uh, Dirty Mind and Controversy, two of my, yeah, two of my favorite, most favorite albums. So that's when I first met Prince. Prince met me when I filmed a little bit and made my way into Paisley Park on the set of one of his music videos by telling the producer that I knew how to load film into a film camera, which I didn't, but I knew that was the only way that I, that I could potentially get into Paisley Park. Uh, so that was in 1993, it was on a music video shoot. Um, I, got a, I got a text that I answered, hoping that it was for work, and it was, and they said, can you load film? I said, I can, thinking I had a few days to go learn how to do what they were asking me, and they said, great, we need you out here, and I tried to get out of it. I'm like, oh no, well, I'm not available today, and in the midst of me trying to backtrack and, and get out of it, she said, Chanhassen, and it just clicked. I'm like, Chanhassen, there's the only person in Chanhassen that could potentially be, be making a music video has gotta be Prince, and I said, I'll be right there. Uh, so I showed up and, and they took me over to the, the main camera assistant who I would be working for. There were guys from LA that had flown in and the guy's like, okay, so you know how to load this magazine? It was, you know, back in the film days. Uh, and I said, yeah, I know, I know how I like to do it. How would, but how would you like me to do it? And he knew right away I had no idea because really it's not a creative thing loading a mag. There's one way, there's one right way to do it. And if you don't do it that way, you mess it all up and, <laughs> uh, but he had no choice but to teach me at that moment. Mm -hmm. So to make a long story short, I walked into Paisley Park onto the main sound stage, and Prince was literally right there finishing a, a shot that they were doing. Uh, and he looked over at me and saw this, this kid that didn't look like the rest of the crew. I had big curls and long hair, and I was you know, a brown kid in a predominant, predominantly uh, white setting. And he came up to me, he's like, where are you? <laughs> uh, and I really had to do a double take and look around and be like, is he talking to me? Uh, and, and sure enough, he was. So that was that was when I first met him. Walking into Paisley Park, what were your first impressions of like Paisley Park as a whole? I had driven by it, having grown up in Minnesota. I had driven by it, so I kind of knew you guys have have been there recently. Um, back in 1993, Paisley Park was kind of like the sh shining beacon on a hill. There was nothing around it, so there's been a lot that's been built up. Uh, strip malls and stores and other businesses. But back then, it literally, it was just woods and then Paisley Park. Uh, so to me, being able to finally step in was really huge, but I was also nervous because you got to remember, I had told them that I could do this thing that I couldn't do. So I was really nervous walking in there, both about, okay, how am I, how am I gonna get by that, but also the, the potential of seeing or, or meeting Prince because I had never seen him uh, in, in person, you know at the time. So uh, I walked in, I was just in awe, but really right off the bat, he came up to me and which made it, <laughs> made it really nice, but made it even more nerve wracking because mm -hmm. now he knew the guy that was going to mess up his film. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I didn't. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't. And, and it all worked out. And so, you know, the rest is history from there. Do you remember which music video that first one was? I think I don't remember because I was so nervous and I was in the back room loading 
it was something from gold, I believe. But after that, one video that I just like sticks in my head, and I don't know if this was it, was Endorphin Machine because uh, they play that so loud. And when you do a music video, you know, it's a track that plays and, and they're lip syncing to it, but they played it so loud and over and over and over again. <laughs> Luckily, I like the song, but like it's, it's been burned into my mind. I love hearing it because it takes me back to, you know, back to that time. So no, I know I, I do love it, but I'm not sure if that was the first day or not. Because the other thing too that happened that the, the first time I went in there, they had hired me, and I didn't know why they hired me so last minute. But, you know, a lot of things that happened in and around Paisley were not very well pre-planned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was all very spontaneous. So both me coming in was kind of last minute. But another thing that I saw that just kind of opened my eyes to both the industry and to the level that you had to be to work with Prince was that that day he fired the cinematographer who they had flown in from L.A. to shoot those things and send him home. So I'm like, wow, okay, this is how quickly it, it starts and how quickly it can end. One thing that comes up quite a lot with a lot of different people that worked uh, at, at Paisley Park um, in different creative ways is this whole thing about coming in in one capacity and then doing something else and Prince encouraging people to do things that they didn't know that they could do and giving them the opportunity to, to do things. So how, how did that play out for you in your journey coming in saying that you could just load film and, and work in that capacity to, to being his photographer. That is very true. And most of the people that have worked uh, with Prince can attest to the fact that they probably started doing one thing. You may, you may have been his chef, but then you were booking his show. Or you may have been the driver, but you became his security and then his manager. So uh, we all have similar stories. Part of that, and, and I'll answer your question, but I think part of that is Prince didn't want to have lot of people around him. He didn't want one person that just did this and one. So if he was able to see something in somebody and say, oh, they can, not only can they do this, but they can do this, he could reduce the number of people he had to deal with. So I think part of it came just from a practical reason for Prince. Like, why do I need 20 people when three people can handle everything that I want? And, and I, you know, I can trust these three people. Uh, so I think that came from there. For me, um, that first introduction working and, you know, I had returned to Minneapolis to get into the film industry. I don't know why I chose Minneapolis. That wasn't like, you know, <laughs> the, the heart of the film world, but I wanted to be back home. I, I really like Minnesota and, and Minneapolis. So I, I wanted to get into the film business. That was an early opportunity for me. Being a film loader is probably the, the lowest position in terms of the camera crew on productions, but it was a good introduction to it for me. Uh, from there, I became a, a, a camera assistant or a focus puller is what they call it here in England. And basically it is what it is. You, you change the focus on the camera as the subject moves back and forth to maintain focus. Uh, if you can imagine on a music video with prints, with cameras that are flying around and a, and a person that's moving around and no rehearsals, it's, it's quite a feat to get them in focus and they're not always in focus. And so Prince, we would do playback and he would watch uh, and so he got to know me pretty well because sometimes things were in focus and other times they weren't. And if they weren't, he'd come up and look at me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would offer to give him the little handheld focus machine and say, I'll run around and you try to keep me in focus, <laughs> which he didn't think was all that funny. But um, I think I was one of the few people that, that engaged him and, and, and spoke with him. Uh, and so he appreciated that. And again, like I said, I, I looked different than most of the people that he was used to coming mm -hmm. through. Uh, but he also recognized that I had a passion for, for it. And so beyond the technical aspects of filmmaking, I aspired to be, you know, uh, have more creative input. And so one of the early, I remember uh, er, another early opportunity that Prince gave me that kind of took me out of the, the technician world and into a more creative world was I was on another music video. It was a LA crew that he had brought in that was shooting it. I was the local kid they had hired to hit the slate and, and, and do some of the technical stuff on the cameras. And there was a shot that they were trying to get, um, and Prince just wasn't happy with the angles and, and everything. And he looked at me, because he kind of knew me and recognized me, he was like, can you do it? Uh, and I didn't want to step on any toes, so I looked over at the DP, the, the director of photography, just like, you know, what do I do in this situation? I don't want to step out of line. And he, he was so flabbergasted, because he couldn't do it, and he was like, yeah, go for it. So Prince said, what would you do? And I said, well, 
this angle, I, the reason you don't like it is because you've seen it so many times and I know you don't want to repeat things. I would shoot from here and he's like, okay, do it. And so then I found myself standing on top of his purple grand piano that's in that small room. Uh, I took my shoes off, obviously, and I filmed and he's like, yeah, that's it. Uh, and so that again was a moment where, where he saw the potential uh, and then so I all of a sudden became a camera operator and so I was I would get called out to, to operate the camera and from there it just it progressed okay I did the lighting and then he was calling me to shoot everything for him uh, I was so he, he saw me as an as an image maker he liked the way I, I did lighting and one day when I had gone to Paisley Park in, in the winter to work on something with Prince I had brought a small case that held my still camera equipment. And I was a hobbyist. I, w I didn't really build myself as a still photographer, but I had the gear and I didn't want to leave it in the car because it was just freezing outside and I didn't want it to get damaged. And Prince looked in, you know, this huge space, Paisley Park, and he knew every inch of it. And so he saw something that was out of place. He's like, what's that? Uh, it was a silver, like Halliburton type case. And I said, oh, that's my still equipment. And he's like, huh, you're a still photographer? And I tried to kind of, I mumbled my way through like, yeah, I'm trying like, <laughs> And he, he walked away. We shot what we were going to shoot video-wise. And then as I was leaving, uh, his producer came up to me and said, Prince would like to come for you to come back and photograph his band. We, he's got a tour coming up, and you know he wants to see what you do. So that was my first kind of, I guess, audition as a still photographer. I went in. I shot his band in Paisley Park in, in the sound stage. It was John Blackwell, Renato Neto, um, and... Uh, those images came back. It was film. I went in. I was really nervous. I had them kind of presented like how I thought a photographer would present his work. I had no idea. Uh, and he kind of flipped through it, laughed. He was there during the shoot, but he didn't kind of like, he didn't hover and <clears throat> and micromanage. He just let me kind of do my, my thing with those guys. Uh, and then so when he saw the images, he was, you know, I felt like he liked them. So he said, great. Uh, and then walked away again. And as I was wrapping up and it had gone as well as I had hoped it could go, his producer came and said, Prince would like you to come back and photograph him. And I got really nervous and I'm like, what? But I thought he already had picked, like I thought he flew in guys from New York and LA and he's set and he's, and she said, no, he, won't, he, he did, but he would like you to photograph him, come up with some ideas. I'm like, that's a tall order, come up with some ideas. <laughs> uh, but that was it. And so it, you know, I was able to go back film, photograph him, he liked those, and he then asked me to go on tour with him, which was like, you know, a dream. How would Prince react when you were showing him photos and he saw something that he really liked, and how would he react when he saw something that he just thought was terrible? Well, we, we would, um, once I started shooting digitally and, and we had kind of the immediate feedback that you're able to have with digital, I would load the images uh, onto a computer. I would go through and do my first edit, you know, get rid of the, the out of focus shots that were, you know, not intentionally out of focus and, and anything that would just, you know, didn't fit or wasn't good. Uh, and then I would do one more edit thinking about what I think Prince would like and I would get rid of more because I didn't want to present Prince with a thousand images that I took. I had to narrow them down. And then we'd sit on the laptop uh, and he was pretty focused and it usually would happen after the band had gone home. It was the last thing we did at night. So I ended up spending many hours with him, you know, in the wee hours of the morning going through images. Uh, and it, it was usually... Sometimes it would be nerve wracking for me when I would do an edit and I wasn't happy necessarily with, with what we had gotten. So it'd be really nerve wracking to, to see what his reaction was. But he would, anything that he liked, he would like, you know, he would point like, yeah, that one. And I'm there kind of either starring or, or deleting or, you know, making some notes. Um, and if he didn't like, he would actually do the same thing. If he liked it a lot or if he didn't like it, he would turn his head and give me this, this look, like either what were you thinking or wow, that's cool. And I, and I had to decipher myself what, what it was. And I could usually tell by the image, but sometimes I couldn't. So he would give me that look. And, and then I just remember those times because there were certain images that I really liked, right? And I would go through and I would get to one of them hoping that he would like be like, yeah, that one. And if he didn't, I would pass it. And then I would like hit the button back like I did it by accident just to let him have a, a second glance at it, hoping that he would change his mind. And sometimes he would and be like, oh yeah, that one. 
And other times he'd look at me like, okay, what are you doing? You're going the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it wasn't necessarily the, the, the same thing. It was a very interactive, you know, sometimes it was, like I said, it was at the end of the night. And if he was tired, we went through quickly. If he still had energy, we would do it. And, and he would tell me about, oh, I, you know, I like this. And if, if you do something again like this, let's, let's change it up. And so he had some, some notes for me, um, but never like very consistent. So either I would walk away from those things really elated and happy. And, and sometimes I'd be like, wow, OK, that didn't, that didn't go as well as I had hoped. I got to figure it out for, for next time. What was the kind of the, the split difference between times when you were just shooting him for no particular reason or no particular project and then times where it was like okay w this is going to be for an album or it's going to be for this specific thing or um and, and how would that work differently compared to when there was no particular reason early on when i started photographing him uh outside of the initial shoot that i did you know as kind of the audition um which ended up into in some tour books uh once I was on the road and I was and I was photographing him during one night alone, a lot of the reason and I wondered, I'm like, wow, I'm taking so many pictures of this one person. What could he possibly want? But but he obviously he cared for the fans and he knew fans liked images and and we were doing different cities in Europe. Uh, and so it was for his music club. Really, a lot of the images that I was making were servicing the music club just to have new content um, to get fans excited about the shows. So it was rarely uh, that I would know, okay, we're going to do this, this shoot right now specifically for an album cover or specifically for a tour book or specifically for, you know, for my website. It was always just anything that was cool. We would find ways to use it. Uh, I think, um, he did plan at one point he was talking about taking musicology and making it a world tour, which would, would have been fantastic. And that was one of the things I was really looking forward to. I'm sad that that didn't happen. But I did, I flew back to Minneapolis to Paisley Park and, and Sam was there. And we were doing that shoot intentionally for a world tour book. And, and Sam and I had gone through the, the web and you know looked at the, the cities that were selected and, and picked images, iconic images from that city. And then I was photographing Prince on a green screen and we were putting him into those, into those images. So there's even a picture in my book that looks like him in an old Russian, really ornate looking building. That's a composite image um, that I shot in Paisley Park. And then we put that background on it. So that was, a, that was a specific case. And so for those things I knew, but a lot of the things were very spontaneous. I mean, me going to Morocco, I didn't even know at the time that I was flying to Morocco that he's making a music video. I think he got there, looked around, said, oh my God, this is amazing. Where's Afshin? Oh, why isn't he here? Okay, call him. Uh, and then I'm on, a, on the next flight out to Morocco or the same thing with, with Panama. So it was always kind of very spontaneous last minute, um, which was challenging and exciting. And, and, and luckily I had a family who, who understood and supported me in, in this. You know, I ended up burning some bridges with other companies that I worked with because I'd be like, Prince calls and I'm, I'm gonna go to Morocco, sorry. Um, it became difficult to do that because professionally, I, I, I didn't wanna do it to Prince and I felt bad doing it to these other people. So I had to find the balance of, of that. Uh, but it was, it was mostly that, no, like just, I don't know. I mean, he, I enjoyed being around him and I think he enjoyed being around me. And then there was the added benefit that I was a photographer. Uh, and so I was able to pick up my camera when something was neat and put it down other times and, and hang out. Um, yeah, it, it, felt, it felt organic in, in, in that way. What can you tell us about the atmosphere and the vibe at 3121 in Vegas? And uh, were you there on the night that Michael Jackson showed up? And did you try and get a photo of them? Because Prince joked that a photo of them together would be worth a million dollars. The Vegas shows were amazing. It was the it was the first time he did a residency, and I think he liked it because it it the um, the toll that being on the road takes on your body and psyche uh, is non-existent. He could go sleep in his own bed, you know, go to L.A. or Minneapolis in between. Um, so I think he really enjoyed it, and it was a great place for all the fans to to come together and see other fans from from other places. You know, it was almost like this um, uh, this well, not a, I don't want to call it a mecca because it, maybe it doesn't go that deep, but it was a it was a cool place for everyone to gather. Uh, 
And then he had so many aspects. I mean, from the keys at the Rio being changed to Prince's image, and it was one of the images that I had taken of him, which was cool, to having the restaurant be a Prince-themed restaurant, all of those touches. Uh, yeah. All of those touches were, were fantastic. And then, of course, the, the music is what it is, um, as always. But then he would have, occasionally, he would have... Uh, a party afterwards, or he'd have people to his suite. So he, there was something magical about the initial 3121 house that I think from that point, we just tried to recapture and recreate um, for people. And it's not so much that we recreated it, it just, it, it evolved and became its own thing. So I thought, I thought Vegas was cool. Um, I was there the, the night that, that Michael was there, but I didn't know Michael was there. I was so focused on Prince. And like so many other rooms that Prince is in, it doesn't matter who else is there, he's the center of attention. So I've walked into spaces where it's been CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and A-list actors and, and people that typically anyone else would just you know lose their mind seeing. And then Prince walks in the room and, and these people are like, you know, are, are lost and just completely attracted to him. And it's, um, it's cool to see and, and, and uh, it's a point of pride being connected with the person that, you know, that does that for other people. So that was cool. Um, I have just, can I ask you guys one question? Yes. Because I'm an, I'm an old guy, but you guys are really young and I'm just impressed and happy to see young people who appreciate Prince. How did you guys get into it and, you know, decide, decide to, do both this show, but how did you get into the music and, and become fans? Ooh, that's like, this is actually really funny because we recently did a video on that. So for me, it's like I accidentally discovered all of my mom's vinyl in our attic because I originally grew up in Holland. So like there was, Prince was obviously really big there, had a few more hits than in the UK. And um, I think my mom even saw Vanity Six perform in Holland once. So that's I'm amazing. very jealous of that. So <laughs> that's how I got into Prince. And I've just always loved him. And through him, I've grown up on like loads of artists from like back in the days when I find that music was still good, which it's right. not now in my opinion. And we, start, we decided to start our YouTube channel in 2004. 15, I think so and we made a video that was our first video was about Prince and the way he like distributed music but like through a different way so like when you had the albums with the newspapers and stuff like that and that's how we started it and then we decided to continue with it after he passed away as well that's incredible uh, I, I'm from a musical family so my cousins are producers songwriters had their own record label they're in studios uh, another cousin is a famous artist um, and my family are into all kinds of different music, but we all really love funk. So when I was a little kid, I remember just going to my cousin's house, going to the studio, and they'd put vinyls on the turntable. And it might one day it might be like Cameo, one day it might be Zap, one day it might be George Clinton, other days it'd be Prince, Revolution, NPG, all kinds of stuff. So I grew up on all of that stuff. Um, I specifically remember like being really young and kind of staring at the Diamonds and Pearls holographic cover because I'd never seen anything like that before. It's like, wow, this is cool. Um, and then. I guess when I got really, really into Prince and, and the fandom um, was kind of around um, around the time that that you started taking the photos of him. So like one night alone kind of time, like just pre musicology, like those early kind of two thousands. And that's when I signed up to Prince.org, where I'm now a staff member and I've you know, been on the site for you know twenty years or so. Um, but the interesting thing about that time was that that was probably his most kind of niche time. He was connecting with the fan base directly. He wasn't so much in the media spotlight until musicology happened. It was kind of that kind of those few years where it was all about MPG MC and doing independent stuff. And, and, uh, and so you could really, you could really kind of get a much deeper connection to what he was doing than I think, uh, at other times. Um, and then, uh, I didn't get to see the one night alone tour. Unfortunately, uh, it wasn't, wasn't really able to go to that at that time. But uh, by the time 21 Nights rolled around, I was working. I was in my early 20s and uh, I went to like six shows, like four after shows, met him after one of the shows as well in, in uh, the Indigo. And uh, yeah, that was just, it's just incredible opportunity. So what you were saying about Vegas, I think from having the thing in London, when you live near somewhere where a residency is happening and you're like a super fan, it's just the best thing ever because you have so many opportunities to just go to, to just go. So it's interesting you mentioned Prince.org. 
So before I knew about Prince.org, it was actually on the One Night Alone tour that I found out about Prince.org because, again, even though I was part of the tour and everything, there was a lot of information that I just didn't know, like, okay, where are we going to next or where is he going to play tonight? And I think it was DJ Dudley who was on that tour said, oh, just check on Prince.org. I'm like, what's that? You know, I'm like, oh, is that Prince's site that I don't know about? Because I thought it was just the music club. He's like, no. Just go to Prince.org. All the information you need is right there. So that actually, for someone that was in the Prince camp, Prince.org was a really great tool to find out what was going to happen. <laughs> but we didn't know. Thanks for watching. That's it for part one of our exclusive Uncovering Prince interview with Afshin Shahidi. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss part two coming soon.